Okay, it's good to see everybody in again this afternoon, and uh, for those of you watching on television, this is just the beginning of another four programs that we'll be uh, producing this afternoon, and again, we always like to emphasize that we're just an informal Bible study. We don't claim to be professional, we don't claim to be theological, but uh, we just like to open the scriptures in a way that even, uh, even kids can understand. You know, Iris and I get so thrilled as we travel and we'll go to these seminars and 10, 12 year old kids will just come up and either give her or I a hug and then parents get almost a little embarrassed and they said, well, they watch you every morning, they feel like they, own, uh, they know you. So we do realize that even though our audience here is on a weekday afternoon and we have to depend mostly on people who are retired, yet rest assured that we do have a lot of younger people that are uh, learning and uh, studying the word with us. Uh, I think I'll just let the uh, announcement concerning the books and the tapes go till the end of the program, and we'll just get right into where we've left off in our previous program, which for those of you in the studio, of course, was a month ago. For those of you on television, it was yesterday. But uh, we're going to jump right in now at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. Now, I don't know how far we're going to get this afternoon, but we're going to take it as it comes. Okay. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, where in the previous verse he had admonished us to pray for kings and those in authority. And then verse 3, he emphasizes that this is perfectly proper, that it's not a selfish intent or anything like that when we pray for our own good, our own pursuit of happiness, which is after all the reason for government. Government is there for the purpose of of protecting its citizens. And uh, it's our privilege then to pray for our men in high places that they might continue to give us freedom and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And then he says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. So never neglect to pray daily for our men in high places that indeed we might continue to enjoy Liberty like no other nation on earth has ever before enjoyed. And uh, I'm afraid too often we take it for granted, even as believers, that uh, this is just commonplace. No, it is not. We are so blessed. The grace of God has been showered on this nation like no other people on earth. And uh, we should never take it for granted. All right, but now then let's go on into verse 4. The same God who is pleased when we pray for men in high places and for our government, the same God would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now that's quite a statement, isn't it? Because those of us who are realists, we know that only a small percentage of the world's population has ever come to know salvation, all the way from Adam on up. It's always been just a small remnant that have maintained a faith fit for salvation. Israel, Israel, even in spite of the fact that they had so much going for them, as Paul says in Romans chapter 2, what advantage then hath the Jew? Much, every which way. They had all the good things going for them but chiefly they had the Word of God. And so it's the same way with us. See, we, we've been so blessed and we have so many things going for us as a nation of people, and yet I'm afraid that it's only a small percentage that have any true saving faith. The vast majority of our people, as I've said on this program over and over, they never even think about eternity. And uh, that's not what God wants. A lot of people, I think, just think that God has only chosen just a few, and those are the only ones he's concerned about. Don't you believe it? The scripture is full that God died for all. In fact, we're just going to start looking at the scriptures in that regard. You ready, honey? Here we go. Come all the way back with me to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, and remembering the verse now that we're kicking off from, for it's the very will of God that all men should be saved. That's what he had on his mind when he provided the plan of salvation. Not just for the few, but it's for all. Okay, Romans chapter 10. 
I'm going to drop all the way down to verse 13. Romans 10, verse 13. Now, we realize, of course, that there are theological concepts that uh, if God has chosen you to go to heaven, then, of course, you're going to go to heaven. Come what may, somehow or other, you're going to make it. But on the other hand, if you've been chosen to go to eternal doom, there's nothing you can do about it, you're going to go there. Well, I beg to differ. I just cannot go along with that thinking because of too many verses like we're going to be looking at right now. Romans 10, 13. This does not give any indication that you're headed for hell and there's nothing you can do about it, or you're headed for heaven and you're going to get there regardless of what you do. It just doesn't fit. But look what it says. Romans 10, verse 13. For whosoever... How many does that include? Anybody. No limit. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise. See? Now, it doesn't say how many are going to be in the whosoever, but nevertheless, the potential is that anyone who will call on God for salvation, his opportunity is as good as anybody else's. All right, let's turn to another one. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we can just drop down to verse... Just a second, honey, I'm going to find it. Verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Don't forget what we read in Timothy. For God would like to have all men to be saved. And remember the word all. A-L-L. -L. All right. Verse 14 now of 2 Corinthians 5, and just watch the language. For the love of Christ, and of course love is uh, synonymous with his mercy and grace. For the love of Christ constraineth us, or drives us, because we thus judge, or we thus conclude, that if one died for how many? All! See, he didn't die for just the few. He died for the whole human race. Not just Israel, everyone. Not just the Gentiles, everyone. He died for all. All right, and then verse 15. And that he died for all. See, repeated twice in two verses. He died for all that they who live, those who call upon him now for salvation, according to Romans, that those who live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. But the point I want to make is that he died for all, not just for the few. All right, but now let's go all the way to the other side of 1 Timothy, and let's move into Hebrews. Now, that's just a few pages to the right of uh, 1 Timothy, and let's go into Hebrews. I think it's chapter 2. Well, we have this same concept, and we're just going to show it as clearly as we know how. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Now again, i got to force myself to slow down. I had a gentleman call again the other night, and he said, Les, slow down. He said, I can't find them as fast as you do. And uh, we, we do appreciate the fact that our television audience sits there with their Bible on their hand and uh, with a pen and note. And so uh, we do. We take that into consideration. We're not just here to preach at you. We're here to help you find these scriptures and to rest on what they say and hopefully by faith just take it as the Word of God. All right, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. And I think Paul wrote Hebrews. We're going to be teaching it before too much longer. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, that is, when he took on human flesh. And we'll be looking at that later this afternoon. And so he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. Now here it comes. That he, by the grace of God, not because anybody deserved it, but by the grace of God, he should taste death for how many? Every man. See? His death was sufficient for every human being that has ever lived from Adam until the end of time. It was sufficient. He tasted death 
for every man. Not just for those who believe, but for everyone. All right, let's move on a little further back to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. And that's right after Hebrews and James, and then the little first letter, and then the second letter of Peter. 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 9. Got it? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering. That's another word for grace and mercy. But he is long-suffering to us. Word. Why? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance or to a change of direction. Now, you can't get it any plainer than that. Now, when you see those terms that no one should perish, that, of course, should remind you of that well-known verse that everybody learns as soon as they start going to Sunday school. What's that? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, see, not just a few, that whosoever should believe in him should not, what? Perish, but have everlasting life. And so it's just a fact of Scripture that God is not willing that any should perish. All right, come back with me now then to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And so God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, the reason I teach is so that people can share these things with others who probably never look at the Word of God, and that's why I, I take it slowly and verse by verse, and, and we pick every word out and, and examine it. All right, the next one I want to look at in this same verse is that not only does God expect everyone to come to a knowledge of salvation to be saved, but to come to a knowledge of the what? Truth. Not much of that around anymore, is there? You just don't hear a lot of truth anymore. You hear a lot of flim-flam, you hear a lot of stuff that does not line up with Scripture, but we have to take the time to dig out what in the world is truth. All right, let's go back. The first one I always think of when I think of truth is Ephesians chapter 1. Now again, that's only back a few pages. To the left, Ephesians chapter 1 a verse that we use periodically on the program because it is so explicit in what it says. Ephesians 1, verse 13. Ephesians 1, verse 13. Wait till you find it. Ephesians 1, verse 13. Now remember, Paul always writes primarily to the believer. But as he writes to the believer, it also speaks, of course, to the unbeliever as well. And so to us believers, he said, in whom you also trusted, placed your faith. After, now watch the language here, after you heard the word of what? Truth. See how plain this is? We became believers after we heard the word of truth. All right, now in this particular instance, what is truth? The gospel. See, and a lot of times I'll say truth and the name of Jesus Christ are synonymous because Christ is truth and truth is Christ. All right, but here we're going to define it a little closer that truth is the gospel. And of course, who's at the heart of the gospel? Jesus Christ. And so look at it again in whom you also trusted or placed your faith after you heard the word of truth. And the word of truth is the gospel of your salvation. And that in whom, the, the Christ of truth, in whom also after you believed, then you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. All right, now then when Paul identifies truth as the gospel, then we'll go back once again, as we've done probably 100 times on this program, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. 
1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and uh, I'm, I'm so thrilled that I'm beginning to see more and more people use this instead of John 3, 16. I mean, John 3, 16 is good. I don't take anything away from it, but it's not the gospel for us today. John 3, 16 was spoken primarily, of course, to the Jewish people because Jesus spoke it in his earthly ministry, or John wrote it with regard to his earthly ministry. But here, Paul now, after the fact of his death, burial, and resurrection, now he tells us what gospel it is to be saved. And this is the gospel of truth that he identified in Ephesians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 again, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, not a gospel, it's the gospel. It's exclusive is the word I like to use. There aren't a half a dozen out there. There is only one. Regardless of who we are, where we come from, there is only one valid gospel. And it's the gospel that Paul says, I preached unto you, and which you have received, and wherein you stand. Now remember, he's writing to believers there at Corinth, a Gentile congregation. And then verse 2 makes it so plain, by which, by this gospel that Paul has now shared with these Gentiles, by which you also are, what? Saved. See, a lot of people don't like that word, but it's a scriptural word, and it denotes a salvation, a saved from doom, see? All right, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory, in other words, like I always put it, that you know what you believe, lest you keep in memory what I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. Now here comes the gospel. This is the truth as Paul defines it. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Now again, I'm going to stop and define that. Why does Paul always refer to this as his gospel? Well, because it was to the apostle Paul that the ascended Lord... Not Jesus and his earthly ministry, but it's the ascended Lord who has now finished the work of redemption with his death, his shed blood, his burial, and his resurrection, see? And so after he had ascended, then he revealed to this apostle that now that's the means of salvation. Not the miracles of his earthly ministry, but the miracle and the power of his death burial, and resurrection. So that's why he uses the words, that which he also received. See, Paul is the first one to whom God revealed that he would now save the multitudes, not through the law of Israel, not by virtue of Judaism, not by virtue of Christ's earthly ministry and his miracles, but by believing that finished work of the cross. All right, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that? Christ died for our sins, and we've already seen in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, who are included in the hour? Everybody. Everybody. He died for the sins of the whole world. And so he died for our sins according to the scriptures. Verse 4, he was buried, and that he rose again according to the scriptures. And... Uh, he was buried, I'm sorry, verse 4, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, that is what we call the gospel or the truth of God as we must believe it in this age of grace. All right, now if you'll come back to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and look at our verse 4 again, now it'll make even more sense, hopefully. 1 Timothy chapter 2, again verse 4. The God, our Savior, of verse 3, who would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, and that is that Christ died, was buried, and rose from the dead. All right, now then, as we slip into the next verse, verse 5, I, I could spend even a little more time on verse 4, but we want to move ahead a little further today. Now in verse 5, this is going to just hammer home the whole fact of who Christ of the cross really is. All right, for there is one God, 
one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Quite a verse, isn't it? Now you think of all the religions, the Orientals and so forth of the world, with their various priests and priestesses and so forth. My, this verse just screams. No, that's not what it is. There is only one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. All right, but now let's go back first and pick up the first part of verse 5. There is one God. Now let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 5, all the way back to the Old Testament. See, that's what we like to do, if at all possible, just tie all of the Scripture together. Even though the Apostle Paul is the one who writes to us Gentiles, yet we know that, uh, that all Scripture is inspired and is profitable. I said chapter 5, honey, it's chapter 6. Deuteronomy, chapter 6, dropping down to verse 4. Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 4. All got it? Hear, O Israel. Now remember, this is Moses. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now you see, that's why the Jewish people accuse us in this age of grace and as New Testament believers as having more than one God, which flies in the face of their Old Testament belief. And this is the verse they will use. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Well, yes, he's one God, of course he is, but from our New Testament perspective now, we reckon that he is a God in three persons. All right, now, in order to, to pick up what Paul is talking about, that uh, the one God is also the man, Christ Jesus. See, now this is what we have to understand, that the triune God, or the God of, of uh, what Moses is speaking of, the one Lord, was the invisible Godhead. And a lot of folks cannot seemingly understand it. And of course, I don't understand it, but I can take it by faith that the triune God, as we come up through the Old Testament economy, was for the most part invisible. Now at times, he would become human, a uh, theophany, as the theologians call it, and he appeared to men in human form. Now, of course, we know that he appeared to Adam and Eve in the garden. He walked with them. He, he wasn't an invisible spirit. He walked with them in, in human form. And uh, we know that uh, Abraham, the perfect example, saw the Lord, saw God, in human form. You remember when the three men came down the trail and Abraham invited them under the shade tree and fixed for them the fatted calf? And what did the three men do? They sat down and they ate. And then as you go further through that chapter, you realize that one of those three men was the Lord himself in human form. And uh, then a little later, we find that Moses at the burning bush, same thing. God spoke out of the burning bush. But as you come down to the place where Moses now says, well, what's your name? When I go back to Egypt and tell the Israelites that God has sent me, they're going to ask, what's your name? And what did the God of the burning bush answer? You called tell Israel, I am hath sent you. I am that I am. And then you go all the way up into John's Gospel, chapter 8, and they were accusing Jesus of having a demon, and he goes through that conversation, and then they finally say, you mean you're not even 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Who do you think you are? And what was Jesus' answer? before Abraham was, I am. So he was the same one that spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. And so we have all this uh, building of proof that the invisible God was in three persons, and at times one of the persons of the Godhead took on human form throughout the Old Testament. And then, of course, when we get to the New Testament, he came by way of Bethlehem, 
in the flesh. All right, now let's look at that one then from the New Testament in John's Gospel. John's Gospel, chapter 1. Now, I don't think I'm going to have time to finish all this in this half, half hour, but uh, we're, we're just going to uh, exhaust it as much as we can. Why Paul emphasized that the mediator between God and man was the man, Christ Jesus, and yet he never stopped being God. All right, John's Gospel, chapter 1. These are verses that we use a lot of times when we teach Genesis 1, that Christ was the creator. All right, John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word. And that's capitalized. It's a term of deity. And the Word was with God, but more than that, the Word was God. See, there was no separating it. And then verse 3, all things were made by Him, that is, the Word. And without Him was not anything made that was made by the Word. All right, now then, when you drop down to verse 14, see, the Scripture always interprets itself. And now in verse 14, we see who the Word was. Verse 14, the Word was made, what? Flesh. See, He took on humanity. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Yes, he was born in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth, and for three years went up and down the dusty roads of the land of Israel, from village to village, spent time in Jerusalem at the temple, and indeed he did dwell among the nation of Israel, because John, of course, is writing as a Jew. And so the Word was made flesh, dwelt among us, we beheld his glory, the glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here we have ample proof from the pen of the Apostle John that the Creator person of the Trinity took on flesh and the Twelve experienced all those days of that three years in miracles and wonders and signs knowing that He was the God of glory, the God of Abraham, the God of creation who had taken on human flesh. And this is what we have to understand, that even though God is spirit, yet God the Son took on human flesh. <clears throat> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding.